Hello and welcome to Heartlight Vedic Astrology. Um, this video, in this video, I'm going to go through the uh, planetary transits or Gochara um, for April 2023. Uh, I believe the overarching theme for the month is going to be emerging paradigm breakthrough. So, um, and again, this is all from a Vedic astrology or Jyotish perspective. What I'm going to be talking about. So let's get started. Uh, note first, the information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical, financial, professional, or life advice of any kind. If you are in need, please contact an appropriate professional for support. And then you might take a minute or two to read the rest of this disclaimer. Okay, so um, just an announcement first before I start going through the dates and the interpretation and everything. Um, if you've been following along, um, over the last year or so when I started making videos, I've been um, making these humongous videos, <laughs> um, going through the tran transits, but also like trying to do a lot of teaching as well. Um, because I think, um, people would get more out of it potentially. But the thing is that the videos were getting so long, it was like taking hours to save the files and upload the files. Um, and it was taking me a super long time to make them, and so I couldn't really do more than one big sort of overstuffed burrito with everything in it type of video. So um, what I've decided to do is actually start um, uh, making smaller videos on the teaching points, um, which should also make it easier, I would assume, as a viewer, because some people might just be in interested in interpretation, which these sort of videos are, the Gochar transit videos, but some people might be interested in actually learning a little bit of Jyotish or Vedic astrology as well. And so I'm going to have smaller videos on, on astrology, Vedic astrology concepts that you can always refer to if you want to learn more about certain things, or you can watch videos like this where I just kind of blow through a bunch of charts and sort of transits for the month um, and give some interpretation. All right, so um, yeah, a little bit of st basically the same content, just a different structure format, essentially just teasing things apart. So again, instead of that one big overstuffed burrito, things will be a la carte. So you can <laughs> take what you want to need at a given time and, and perhaps hopefully a more digestible way. All right, so let's get into the dates for April here. Um, April 5th in a few days, Saturn is going to aspect Mercury exactly. So Saturn is going to be shining its light or its influence directly on Mercury. Uh, the next day there's going to be a full moon in Virgo. Um, that's Kanya in Sanskrit and specifically Hasta Nakshatra. Uh, that same day we've got some other stuff going on. So Mercury will cross Rahu in Aries, which is Mesha, um, and that's going to be in Ashwini Nakshatra. And then also on that same day, Venus enters Taurus or Vrishaba. So um, we got a few things going on in a few days here. And then we get a little bit of a break. And then on uh, April 11th, there's going to be exact uh, combustion of Jupiter. Um, and actually, I made a video, one of the concept videos I made so far is uh, on planetary combustion. So if you want to learn more about that, you can check out that um, teaching video. Um, and then on April 14th, we got some things going on. So Sun is going to enter Aries um, and Ashwini Nakshatra. So you can see there's starting to be this pile up of planets in Aries and especially Ashwini Nakshatra. That same day, Venus enters Rohini Nakshatra. On April 17th, Jupiter goes Sunday, so it's going to become unstable because it's leaving uh, Pisces. It's going to be in the last degree of Pisces, so it's going to become unstable. Um, the 19th of April, Saturn aspects Rahu and Ketu exactly, so that's going to be something. Um, and then April 20th, there's going to be a total solar eclipse in Aries Ashwini. So again, Aries and Ashwini, I actually went through... Um, Ashwini Nakshatra and Aries, um, I, I believe in my last transit video, so you might check that out. I will go into a little, I mean, some of that, I'm going to go more into interpretation today, not so much the teaching about Aries and Ashwini today, but information is available, it's out there in my videos. And then, um, and then after the eclipse on the 20th, Mercury goes retrograde the next day, Mars enters a new Nakshatra, Punarvasu. Um, and then Jupiter enters Aries and Ashwini. So again, 
there's all this energy action going on in Aries and Ashwini this month. Um, and then a couple of days later, Mercury goes combust or Asta. And then the next day, Sun crosses Rahu. So we also have all these planets crossing Rahu. So it's going to be a very um, unpredictable month in a lot of ways because Rahu and Ketu, the north and south nodes of the moon, are all about unexpected events, and they're what causes the solar eclipse. So there's going to be a lot of planets um, crossing Rahu and Ketu involved in the eclipse. So it's hold on to your hat, <laughs> you know, buckle up, you know, uh, for the month. There's going to be a lot of uh, you know um, unexpected events. Looks like. Um, and then on the 24th, Sun, yeah, Sun crosses Rahu. The 25th, the next day, Saturn aspects Sun exactly. So again, we've also got this like kind of parade of planets crossing through this sort of barricade or this um, of energy of Saturn and Rahu. Um, so uh, it's, again, it's it's going to cause more instability. And then on the 26th of April, Jupiter leaves combustion. So those are the dates when stuff's going on. Um, let's talk about what all that means. Let's get into Saturn first. So um, so this is the thing. I have, I have a chart here. Um, this is on April 5th, so in a couple days, I believe. Let me just double check. Yes, it's in a couple days. This is like 1215. Um, and this is when, if you look here at the chart, you'll see Saturn in the lower right corner at 9 degrees 1 minute of Aquarius. Uh, Saturn aspects three houses away, so it's going to be shining its light onto Aries here. And um, at that time, we we're going to have Mercury, Rahu, and Venus in Aries. And you can see that um, Sun is at 9 degrees 1 minute and Mercury is at 9 degrees 1 minute. So that means that Saturn is exactly shining its light um, on Mercury at that time. Which I have found, again, I don't hear too many people talk about it, but I have found that that actually um, tends to um, create, you know, um, important events. So, um, so at the time of this exact aspecting of Saturn and Mercury, um, the world that we're looking at here, this is the third, um, this is a Gemini Lugna, rising sign ascendant, um, which is Mituna in Sanskrit. So in the world of Mercury, or in the world of Gemini, Mituna, we have this aspect going on in the 11th house. Um, the thing is, is that since Mercury is in Aries, which is ruled by Mars, and Mars is in Gemini, which is ruled by Mercury, we have a party of Artony here, so we can exchange of houses. So you can essentially, if you, you know, look at this red double-sided arrow here, you can exchange Mars for Mercury. So that means, in a way, um, you know, Saturn and the degrees of Mars is not that different from Mercury. Um, you know, you're going to have three natural malefic planets here on Venus. Um, and Venus is in Sunday, it's in the last degree um, of the sign, so it's not particularly um, stable. So um, there can be rock and roll going on with loved ones, uh, spouse, partner, that sort of thing. Also, um, the arts, uh, vehicles also, uh, possibly. Um, so if we exchange those two planets, Mars and Mercury, that means Mercury is going to be in its own house, in the first house, Lugna. And Mercury in the first house of any chart um, gives it directional strength, or digbala, we call it. Um, being in its so it's going to give mercury strength also mercury being its own sign in a kendra so that's the four squares in the middle there that creates what we call a badra yoga um, that's a planetary combination that indicates things like um, really superior intelligence communication that sort of thing because um, those are things that mercury indicates um, mars at this time is an ardra nakshatra Ardra nakshatra is characterized, or the symbol of that is like a storm or a, uh, like a drop of rain, you know, from the storm. It can also be a teardrop. 
Um, so there can be, there's going to be a lot of like electricity, you know, sudden, sudden, you know, Mars is a very fast moving fiery planet and it's in, um, Ardra. So, um, you know, we're talking like lightning bolts and thunder and stuff like that. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there's going to potentially be actions that frankly cause some sadness or pain or um change at least destruction at least um because again mars is a, a malevolent planet so you're we're going to be looking at more unfortunately the negative aspects of what ardor represents ardor nakshatra as a lunar mansion um it can let me say it can especially when there are positive planets here benevolent planets here um can indicate things like you know, the rain that comes in and, and re, re, um, revitalizes a desert, but the thing is we have Mars here, so um, there's that. And then again, because this exchange is going on between the first house and the 11th house, the 11th house um, signifies things like clubs, groups, societies, um, older siblings, friends, um, and also income. Um, so it looks like there's going to be some tension, especially when you have a par of partner, there's can typically be a tension, um, between the houses that are exchanged and the first house represents self reputation, that sort of thing. So it looks like there's going to be a shakeup here, especially because Saturn is aspecting in here. Saturn is a planet that represents things like structure and Saturn is an Aquarius, which is an air sign. So Saturn, and it's also in Shepta So there's, it's, which um, is a nakshatra that's symbolized by, or it's called like a hundred healers. So this can symbolize things like restructuring, like mental restructuring of um, income that can effectively um, shift sort of personal power, that sort of thing, especially for somebody who's in Gemini right now or who's a Gemini like now. Um, because again, like Mercury's in Ashwini, Rahu's in Ashwini. So, um, that, that nakshatra is all about like, you know, again, healing, movement, travel, power, that sort of thing. So we have a lot of like active, um, energy that these planets are in. Uh, yeah. Let me just make sure I covered everything. The other thing to consider, even though I have this like green circle around Venus, Rahu, and Mercury, um, because that, you know, it's kind of what the eye is drawn to. It's like kind of the obvious thing. But the thing is, you, you know, because we have so many planets here, that also means that these planets like Venus, Mercury, and Mars, if we exchange the planets, are also going to be um, aspecting onto K2 in the fifth house. So fifth house represents things like children, counseling, um, mantras, uh, creativity, that sort of thing. So whatever is being restructured here and pretty quickly, because again, Ashwini is a fast moving nakshatra, Ardra is like, you know, instant lightning bolt type thing. Um, and this could be like, again, like a sudden windfall, frankly. Um, that changes a person's um, again, strength, status, that sort of thing. Um, it's also um, tied in with creativity, counseling, potentially teaching, that sort of thing. So um, there's that going on on the fifth. And also Mercury represents things like business. So, you know, this is probably something like that. It, Mercury can also represent um, like friends, colleagues, business associates, aunts and uncles, that sort of thing. So um, with the different energies lining up here, it looks like there's going to be some, I would say more of a shakeup with self because again, Mercury is the ruling planet for the first house here. Um, then we have on the 19th, so again, Saturn, you know, so on the 19th Saturn, so Mercury is going to move ahead. It's going to, you know, start drifting through Aries. 
And then Rahu and K2 always are in retrograde. So Rahu is backing up here. So in this chart, it's at 11 degrees, but slowly it's going to, you know, go to 10 degrees, 9 degrees, that sort of thing. And then at some point, and Saturn is moving forward. So on the 19th, Saturn moves forward, Rahu moves back, and then they're going to be um, at an exact aspect again. Now this, so at that point, Venus is going to move into Taurus. So Venus is out of the picture. So it's less likely that this involves like a loved one or spouse or something like that. Um, the sun is going to be in there because by that time the sun is going to move up from Pisces into Aries. The sun gives a lot of energy, you know, um, and it's in Aries where it's exalted. So there's going to be a lot, again, a lot of fire, a lot of uh, drive going on here. Um, and when that exact um, aspect happens on the 19th, actually the lugna at that point is going to be Sagittarius, which is a fire sign. <laughs> so, um, you know, so again, there's going to be a lot of action going on here. The other thing is that, so you can kind of almost like flip this chart and it would be sort of similar. Um, the Saturn aspecting Rahu K2 on the 19th will be sort of similar to Saturn aspecting Mercury on the 5th. And either way, because if you flip this chart upside down, 180 degrees, um, all this action is still going to be happening on the 511, the 5th house and the 11th house, so the 511 axis. Uh, access. So um, it's still going to involve things like clubs, groups, societies, socializing, uh, money, income, creativity, children, potentially counseling, teaching. Like there's still that's where all the action's happening. The other thing is that, you know, uh, Gemini and Sagittarius are both dual signs. So there's probably going to be two storylines going on, you know, in this um, configuration. Yeah. So it might be, on one hand, there might be something going on with an aunt or uncle. At the same time, there might be something going on with business. So you might actually have two, again, storylines in parallel going on here. Um, but again, there's going to be a restructuring that happens, and this is going to be a fairly long-term restructuring because Saturn takes 29 years to go through the whole zodiac, and Rahu um, takes 18 years to go through the whole zodiac. So whatever shift um, that takes place um, through this is going to be something that's going to be relatively long-lasting. Um, then what happens? Oh, okay, and then Saturn's going to aspect the sun exactly, so, and that's going to be on April 25th. So I, um, you know, casted a chart for that moment, and this, you know, look at all this energy here. I mean, this is pretty intense, right? So let's break it down. So what Lugna do we have here? This is happening in Aries or Mesha. Okay, in the first house here, top of the chart, this is a North Indian style chart. Oh, I also have uh, made a video, a teaching video on um, different style charts, it's like North, South, and East Indian. So if you're interested in that, you can check out that video. If you want to learn about how to navigate a little bit um, uh, these charts. Um, in any case, um, so we have an Aries Lugna here. We've got Jupiter, we've got Rahu, we've got Sun, we've got Mercury retrograde. That little line under these planets um, in the software, a line under the planet means it's going retrograde. Just FYI. But so we've got four planets here in Aries. So already that indicates that's uh, Pravraja Yoga, uh, which means that it's an area of focus, obviously, because there's so much going on. There is so much planetary energy. Um, we do have Saturn again in. Aquarius aspecting this. So we also have Saturn actually mixed up in all this. So there's going to be some restructuring that happens. Saturn is in its own sign in the 11th house. So again, we're talking about clubs, groups, societies, um, socializing and income. And again, there's this relationship between the ele this 11th house and the first house of self, status, fame, reputation, well-being. So there's going to be a shakeup here. Um, and the other thing is that you can see that, um, let's see, so Rahu, you can't see, it's a shadow planet, and that's kind of Rahu and K2's nature, is that they are, they hide things, they kind of, you know, um, there's things that are unseen, you know, unexpected, that sort of thing, 
The other thing is that um, both Jupiter and Mercury are within 10 degrees of the Sun. That means that they're combust. And I have another video on planetary combustion if you want to see that, um, if you want to get into what that all means. But um, that means you can't really see the outer aspects of Jupiter and you can't really see the outer aspects of Mercury. So if you can't see Jupiter, Rahu, and Mercury, what do you see? You see the Sun, and the Sun is exalted in Aries here. So there's going to be some bright, it's like a bright shining star, you know, very powerful. The Sun represents things like leadership, authority, father, boss, uh, purpose, direction, that sort of thing. So this is like a glow up, you know, essentially. Um, and again, you also have this uh, Parivartan exchange of houses between Mercury and Mars going on. So if you exchange Mercury for Mars and you put Mars in this first house, now you've got even more fire. You've got fire from Mars. You've got fire from Jupiter. Rahu is, uh, indicates like ambition. And then Jupiter is um, an expansive planet. So it just kind of amplifies all this. I mean, this is like, you know like a superhero type energy, frankly, like, you know, like somebody on steroids. Um, and then Jupiter, Rahu, and Sun are all in Ashwini again. So, you know, the uh, Ashwini Kumaras, the uh, twins who were like celestial physicians to the gods, you know, who um, are symbolized by horses and stuff like that. So, again, there's like this heroic energy. Um, and then if we look at like the exchange here between Mercury and, and uh, Mars, then we, we also have this like exchange here of energy into the third house. So the third house represents things like communication. It can represent things like um, uh, technology. It can represent classical arts, that sort of thing. Um, there may be tension here with the siblings um, because um, Mars is in the third house. The third house represents siblings, especially younger siblings, and Mars is the planet that represents siblings. When you have that combination, though, it's almost like there's too much energy. It's called a karkobhavanasha. And that can indicate that there's actually issues with um, siblings. So even though it seems like, okay, you've got the planet representing siblings and the house of siblings, that's all good. It's actually, in um, from a Vedic astrology perspective, it's actually a little too much. So let me just see what else. Um, and then the second house here, I've circled Venus. Um, Venus is in its own house. It's very strong. And the second house is the house of like savings and assets. So, like, if this was a person, they're going to be a very wealthy person. They've got Saturn in its own sign in the 11th house of income, and you've got Venus in its own sign in the second house of assets and savings and things like that. So this would be a very wealthy person, a very driven person. Um, and actually, when I was thinking about who this might be if it was a person, like, I was thinking... Um, it could be somebody like an action hero, like an actor who's like an action hero in a movie or something like that. Because again, you've got Sun, you know, and Aries, you know, and Ashwini. That's really the only planet you can see. There's going to be a lot of light here. Um, it's going to be hard to deny or miss or take your eyes off. Um, but all this other stuff going on, like the Jupiter and Mercury, and they both have dig bell again, directional strength. So. Um, this person's going to be wise, even though Jupiter's not super strong here, and it's unstable because it's in the first degree. It's Sunday. Mercury's retrograde, so that gives it more strength, but again, it's combust, so you won't see so much the outer aspects, but the inner aspects of intellect are going to be heightened. Um, so this is going to be a very intelligent person, a very active person, also because Aries is what we call a Chara Rashi, so it's a movable sign. It's like people who have a lot of planets and movable signs. Um, so that's like Aries, Cancer, Libra, um, Capricorn. They're always moving. They, these are people who, like, they can't sit still. So, and you've got all these planets. Like, essentially, you've got, if you do the exchange and then you take the Saturn aspect, like, what, six planets? <laughs> like, you know, the energy of six planets on this first house. 
this is somebody who's obviously going to be a celebrity, somebody who's known by their, you know, you would, you'd see them like a picture of them on the internet and you would know who it was, even if you weren't told who it was, that sort of thing. Um, this could, besides being like an action, like a uh, action hero, and I'm, I would actually think that this person would be male because Aries is a male constellation and Sun... Sun, Jupiter, and Mars are all uh, planets that represent male energy. Mercury and Saturn are considered neuter, neuter um, and Rahu um, does have some feminine energy. So overall, this person, even if they're not sort of physically or biologically male, has a lot of male energy. <laughs> um, so, so it could be an action hero. I could also see this being a, like a physician, specifically like a surgeon. Um, because again, Sun represents medicine, Jupiter represents medicine, Saturn represents, so you have three planets representing medicine in this house. Um, it's in the um, Ashwini, you know, Nakshatra, which represents healing, you know, celestial physician, that sort of thing. Um, and then you have Mars, which represents like, um, it can represent things like surgery. Um, and Mars in this chart is in Punarvasu, which is a nakshatra where it's it's like a the symbol is like a arrow a quiver of arrows. So it's like um, some sort of action where somebody's going in and out, and it's something there's because of the points of the arrow there's something sharp. So this could be like somebody suturing, for example. Um, the other thing is because you have Venus and Rohini here. And Rohini is a nakshatra that represents things like attraction and beauty and that sort of thing. And Venus is, you know, sensuality and sexuality and, you know, women and stuff like that. There are gains made through um, beautiful women, beautiful, attractive women um, in this chart. So I could see this person being a cosmetic surgeon, essentially. Um, this could also be if we weren't talking about people, if we were talking about like a place or a thing, this could be like a new innovation in medicine. Um, specifically because Mercury is here in Barani Nakshatra, which is represented by the womb. And again, we have this strong Venus in the second house of gains. Um, you do have Jupiter here, um, which would represent potentially children. I could see how this is some s new procedure or medication that's developed um, for um, fem feminine health, basically. Um, maybe some new, uh, you know, again, uh, procedure or drug that would um, help along those lines. Let me just look at my notes here to see if I missed anything. Um, Mercury again is strong because it's retrograde, it's got directional strength Digbala, but again it's combust um, because it's combusted by the sun and it's qualified by being in the first house um, and there's also a relationship with sun being the fifth lord of uh, mind. Uh, it would also form a Buddha Ditti Yoga which is again more um, confluence that whoever this is, again if this is a person uh, it's a very intelligent person. Um, Jupiter we talked about, Venus and Saturn we talked about r regarding like wealth. Um, there's also, um, excuse me, I think I'm going to, I might end up sneezing. <laughs> I'll just see if I can uh, stave that off. The other thing is that um, all these planets on the Rahu Ketu axis, almost all the planets are on one side of that axis. And so that gives a uh, Kala Sarpa Yoga, which indicates usually a lot of ambition. Um, yeah, so you kind of get the energy <laughs> of, of what's going on uh, April 25th here, you know, again, during this uh, exact aspect of Saturn on the Sun. And again, because it's Saturn, it's restructuring and Sun, um, this is purpose, direction, um, besides health and stuff like that. So there you go. There's that chart. So let's shift to the moon now. So the moon, there's going to be a full moon on April 6th in Virgo or Kanya in Hasta Nakshatra. And I do have a video on symbolism of the moon. So if you want to get into that, you can check that out. 
Um, so full moons are always, you know, it's a lot of nice, beautiful energy, juicy, robust, bright, clear, intuitive, sensual, creative. It's a culmination of energies before this, uh, the moon starts waning again. Um, the symbol of uh, Hasna Nakshatra is the hand, and the deity is Surya, or the sun. So it's kind of funny that, you know, again, we're looking at... Um, you know, a lot of sun energy. So the, sun, the sun's like everywhere this month, um, as soon as it shifts into Aries. Um, so Hasta Nakshatra, when you think of that Nakshatra, besides being symbolized by the hand and the sun, so the hand is gonna be somebody who's skillful, handy, literally handy, resourceful, and the sun is a lot of energy. Um, so, somebody who's active, resourceful, skilled, an artisan. It can also, because the hand can hide things um, and grab onto things, you might also, um, when there's negative influences in this nakshatra, you'll um, have things like someone who's shameless, merciless, thieves, or somebody who like grab, use their hands to grab things from other people. It can uh, indicate alcoholism, uh, but also determination. Um, can be there can also be like a controlling nature here sometimes there can be questionable morality um it can indicate things like palmistry and jyotish because um often those two things are used together um to dive deeply into things um again you have the sun here so there's going to be illumination um, of intelligence so somebody might be good at counseling or advising there's also, because this is again happening in Virgo, and Virgo is ruled by Mercury, there are things like jesting, merriment, comedians, um, clever wittiness, because again, Mercury represents the intellect. Um, sometimes though too, again, if there's instability indicated here, um, somebody might be kind of flighty um, or not dependable. Um, so again, because Mercury represents things like writing, communication, you might and uh, you might have um, people like authors, educators represented here. Handicrafts again, something done with the hands, pickpockets again, thievery and magicians. So sleight of hand. So um, when you have a full moon here, you want you're going to be looking at because the moon represents things like the mind. You're going to be and it's a full moon, so it's a strong moon you're going to have the best aspects of the moon here. So you're going to get more of the um, brighter, lighter, more positive aspects of the different things that Hastin Nakshatra can indicate. Um, so things like intelligence, because again, it represents the mind, counseling, advising, um, wittiness, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. On April 20th, there's going to be a total solar eclipse in Aries Ashwini again. And I did a teaching video on uh, lunar solar eclipses, so that's available if you want to really get into lunar solar eclipses and technically how they're formed and what they all mean. But um, I will get into this particular um, solar eclipse that's happening, so let's look at that. So this is again a total solar eclipse that's happening on April 20th. This is the chart for the exact conjunction of the sun and the moon um, when those are lining up on the Rahu K2 axis. And you can see here that uh, the Lugna, the rising sign, the top uh, diamond here is the ninth constellation, which is Sagittarius. And the nakshatra of this Lugna is Mula nakshatra. So, um, Mula is represented by a bunch of roots that are tied together, and the deity of Mula is Kali, so the goddess of destruction. <laughs> so, you're already getting like a vibe here on this. Um, and the story of Kali was that she was sort of summoned because there was this demon who had the ability, like if he got cut, or I think it was a he, when it, they got cut or injured, and blood would spill, like more demons would pop up from the drops of blood that had spilled. So it's just like the more this demon got cut up or beat up or whatever, the more it multiplied itself. So Kali was summoned um, from the goddess Durga, who's the goddess of pr protection, 
she's like, we need somebody who can, like, you know, we need some special thing to, like, deal with this. So Kali came about, and um, she's depicted as, like, a very dark um, goddess, usually with, like, fangs and blood dripping, you know, from her lips and stuff like that. I mean, she's pretty fierce looking. And what she did was she had the ability to basically um, drink up all this blood and swallow it so that the blood couldn't transform into demons. And that's how she conquered this demon that could kind of replicate itself through injury. So anyway, um, but she still got goddess of destruction, um, even though in, in, you know, and that's what she's sort of known for, but she is actually like a, a very heroic, uh, uh, and she has a very heroic energy as well. So anyway, but intense nonetheless. <laughs> So um, you can already see that this solar eclipse is probably going to be intense. Um, looks like it is. And it's also Sagittarius, as I mentioned before, is a dual Rashi. So there's probably going to be two storylines here going on. And Jupiter, who rules Sagittarius, you can see I've circled it here, is in the last degree of Pisces. So even though Jupiter is in its own sign, it's unstable because it's switching signs, it's switching energies. Um, and we still have this Parivartana going on. You can see the double-sided red arrow between Mercury and Mars. So, and again, Mars is going to be an Ardra Nakshatra, so that storm, right? So we got stormy energy here. Um, this is going to be, you know, something's going to blow in and blow out. Um, it's going to be unstable. Um, and Ardra can also represent things like um, chemicals and electricity. Um, and Mars can represent things like land, so it's feeling like whatever is going down here um, is going to affect things on a very uh, material plane. Um, you know, like it could even be something like an earthquake or a fire or something like that, or some storm that um, unfortunately does a lot of damage. Uh, what else is going on here? We also have Saturn. Again, in its own sign, aspecting onto this big group of planets and Aries, and most of them are in Ashwini. Um, so again, there's going to be some restructuring here, especially um, since Saturn is in uh, Aquarius. You know, it's like ideas, electricity, um, that sort of thing. Um, but Saturn is also another planet that represents things like land and property. So. Um, so again, you know, structure is going to be, there's going to be some structural changes, um, in the land, looks like. And then because, um, the sun is involved here, that's fire. Aries itself is a fiery constellation. Mars is fire. Um, you know, it looks like there's going to be, um, you know, some fire here. Uh... And then Mercury, you know, that's all this with Rahu here. There's going to be sudden, unexpected um, changes. And Mercury's here, so we're looking at like business, travel, commerce, communication, that sort of thing. So it does look like, unfortunately, um, and also because Jupiter, which is a great benefic, it's not playing into this, at least not yet. But you give it a few days, it's kind of kind of swoop in and help. Um, recon, you know, the damage. And Venus is in its own sign, but it's not involved in this. So basically you have this gang up of natural malefics um, in the fifth house here when this is going down. And, uh, you know, again, the moon is eclipsed and it's a new moon, so it's going to be a very weak moon. The sun is going to be eclipsed even though it's uh, in an exalted sign. And then Mercury can swing as a natural benefic or malefic depending on the planets that it's surrounded by. It's surrounded by all these natural malefics, so it's malefic. So um, at least at least this is going down in the fifth house, which is considered a good house. So, um, you know, there might be some saving grace there, but um, it looks like there's going to be quite a bit of destruction here. Um, you know, again, all these planets in the same house, it gives a Prabhraja Yoga or a area of focus. Hamsa Yoga, Jupiter's in its own sign, so there is some grace here, but again, that's not, that Hamsa Yoga is not involved in this eclipse. Uh, um, although Jupiter, 
you can see Jupiter is about to switch signs, and luckily Jupiter is about to switch signs, so it can help, you know, sort this out. Um, and then there's going to be a if we switch Mercury and Mars, uh, Mercury is going to create a um, uh, again a Bhadra Yoga again, and Mars is going to create a Ruchika Yoga. So there's going to be some strength here, but um, it's going to be intense. So as I mentioned, there's, it looks like there's going to be some disruption to land, travel, and, and the grid um, for where the solar eclipse is seen. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go into where the solar eclipse will be seen uh, in the next slide. But I just want to look at this a little bit more. So if this was like a person, for example, um, for example, if this person was a Sagittarius Lugna rising sign, and we were looking at, if we were interpreting this through the lens of like medical issues and stuff, this kind of formation in the fifth house, the fifth house can represent things like the heart um, and the chest, the upper abdomen. This might be somebody who has something like a stroke or aneurysm or heart attack. Um, because again, you have this like restructuring with Saturn, you have Sun, which represent things like the central nervous system, the heart, um, you know, in general vitality, energy, that's going to be eclipsed. You have the moon here, the mind, you have Mercury, which is like reasoning and um, potentially coordination. You have Mars here, which is like sudden unexpected events, or, you know, um, um, also blood, uh, muscles, um, and then you have Rahu, which is again, unexpected things. So this could be like just a, a flare up, basically of something like a stroke or heart attack, frankly. Um, it could also be something like, because it's the fifth house, it might represent um, children for some people, especially if they're a Sagittarius Lugna. This might be some sort of like emergency situation with children or birth, because um, again, Saturn is in Shatabisha, which means 100 healers, and Sun, Moon, Rahu are all in Ashwini, so there's healing here. And then Mercury <coughs> is in Barani, which is symbolized, Barani nakshatra, which is symbolized by a womb. So, um, and then the thing is, is that the, um, because of this exchange of houses between the fifth house and the seventh house, that means that the partner is involved in this. So it looks like it's, it's kind of like an emergency situation potentially for family. Um, this could also be, if we're going to look at it another way, besides like a physical issues with the land, like through a storm or something like that, or a medical issue. Um, if we were looking at this through the lens of business, because the seventh house represents independent business, um, you know, S Saturn is in the third house, uh, Aquarius, that could be technology. Um, you know, Mars is in Ardra, which represents, you know, things like electricity, lightning, that sort of thing. Mercury's business, Mercury's communication, uh, travel. Um, Rahu can represent technology. This might be something like a new disruptive, innovative technology or technological business that's birthed here. So again, depending on if we're looking at a person, place, or thing, you can kind of see um, how this might be interpreted, but you can see that like there's intensity here. Um, there's not um, a lot of stability here. Um, so something's basically being born and, and probably um, the whole life cycle is also dying as well. So, um, and again, this totally depends. I mean, even if, and, and this isn't gonna be the, even though I've been, talking the context of, of like a person, somebody who's a Sagittarius rising ascendant Lugna, again, everybody is going through different planetary periods. So if you read the disclaimer, <laughs> if you took the time, you know, everybody's going through different planetary periods. So um, all Sagittarius people are not going to be experiencing this the same way. The other thing is that their subzodiacs, you know, are going to be different. And um, some of these planets are going to be like Chidragrahas, which means uh, points of weakness or vulnerability. And everybody has different ones of those. So it's a general interpretation for, you know, whoever's listening here. So again, take all this with a grain of salt. And again, it's always best to get a personal reading with somebody to understand what this all means for you, if that's what you're interested in. So as I mentioned, um, 
you know, especially solar eclipses, you have to qualify them. I mean, you know, the solar eclipse is going to happen for the world, so we're all going to feel it to some extent, but especially where the solar eclipse can be seen, that's where you're really going to see um, shifts and changes. So if you look here on April 20th, this little red squiggle snake-like thing with a little one, um, that's the eclipse, solar eclipse path on April 20th. And you can see that's basically going to hit like Western Australia and then Southeast Asia, Malaysia, that sort of thing, um, and the Indian Ocean. So um, there may be some shakeups there. Um, that's where most of this might um, hit, actually. So, and the other thing to know is that um, the intensity and the abruptness of this, like if this was a child being born, if this was like a birth chart for somebody. Um, you could see that um, you would want to qualify because if you just look at the chart, I didn't put a place down. So if that's a chart of somebody who was born in the, in the United States, they're not going to feel the intensity of all this eclipse energy as much as somebody who was born in Perth, Australia, for example, which is where, you know, kind of where this uh, eclipse path is happening. So you also have to take that into account. So again, just you know, kind of um, bringing to mind all the different nuances that you have to consider when you're looking at individual experiences of these energy. Okay, so let's get into some celebrity charts here. So let's look at Tom Cruise. <laughs> so why did I why did I pull this chart up um, or his chart up? Um, why did I do that? Um, well, I was watching Top Gun Maverick, you know, the, the sequel that came out, um, I guess, last year, but I'm, I'm slow to the party, I guess. Um, so I just watched it for the first time last week. I really liked the movie, and um, I was like, oh, you know, this is, like, fairly unusual. Um, and I started thinking about Tom Cruise. I'm like, well, he's a fairly unusual guy, and especially the Maverick character. He's, like, an unusual guy. And I'm like... I was actually thinking more along the lines of like fire, like Maverick, that's so Mars, that's so, I mean, that's essentially what Mars is, <laughs> you know, like a Maverick type energy, fiery and um, insubordinate or rebellious or, you know, doing their own thing. It's like unpredictable, that sort of thing. Um, so then when I started looking at Tom Cruise's chart, I'm like, oh, look at this. He was born pretty close to an eclipse. <laughs> he was born about two weeks away from the lunar eclipse that happened on July 11th, or July 17th. So his birth data, July 3rd, 1962, 15.06 p.m. in Syracuse, New York, is where he's born in the United States. And um, he's, you know, he's, he's very, um, he's got a lot of this energy of Rahu Ketu. So he's, he wasn't born exactly on an eclipse, but almost <laughs> you know so there's a lot of that energy in his chart so let's go through so first things first we look at the lugna the rising sign he's uh his lugna is libra and his um ascendant is in swati so uh, swati nakshatra the symbol there is like blades of grass blowing in the wind um which generally indicates i've seen in people like um a lot of nervous energy not the most stable energy. Um, Libra is ruled by Venus, and Venus has gone to the tenth house here. The tenth house represents things like career and fame. Um, and Venus is in Ashlesha. Ashlesha nakshatra is symbolized by a snake. Um, and Venus represents the arts. Um, also, as a Libra lugna. Um, people who are Libra Lugnas tend to be interested in business because a symbol for Libra in Vedic astrology is um, somebody holding scales, but not the scales of justice like um, in Western astrology, the scales of a marketplace. Also, their 10th house is ruled by moon, um, which can indicate the public. So, um, you know, they tend to be interested in like public types of activities for business and work. Um, but anyway, getting back to uh, Ashlesha, Ashlesha, the, hold on a second, sorry, I had to uncross my legs, my feet were falling asleep. So, um, so Ashlesha is a snake, um, and snakes can be hypnotizing, yeah, um, 
And so I often see for people who are actresses, actors, models, they tend to have placements in Ashlesha. Um, you know, they tend to be attractive and hypnotic. I mean, you want to spend two hours watching them on a screen, for example. Um, and that's all in his 10th house of career. He also has Rahu here. So again, a planet representing ambition, but also unseen hidden things and also disguises and stuff like that. And often you see Rahu and Ketu uh, prominently placed um, in self or uh, career with actors and actresses. So you get more of that. And then you get Moon in Cancer. So there's going to be strength to this house. There's going to be ambition and strength to this house. Also, there's going to be um, Venus and Moon represent women. So, um, and the arts. So there's going to be a lot of drive towards both of those interpretations here. Um, the thing is also Rahu is in Ashlesha. So you've got Venus and Rahu representing the arts and technology and things like film um, and photography in this Ashlesha. So this, um, you know, hypnotizing energy. The moon is in Pusha, which is kind of nice. So Pusha is more of a, like the symbol of that. Nakshatra is a cow. So it's about kind of nurturing and, you know, comfort and um, support, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing to note here is that Venus is lord of also the eighth house of esoterica. Um, so um, that sort of um, hidden energy um, and also not just esoterica but things that are hidden like or um, you know very intense like death and bankruptcy and um, spies and things like that like um, all that kind of intense energy is going to also be brought up into the 10th house of career. And those are the sorts of characters he plays, like the Mission Impossible characters, right? I mean, character, he's like a spy. Um, and then the Maverick, I mean, that's a very unusual person. I mean, not just his personality, but this guy's like, you know, this amazing, brilliant, like, fighter pilot, right? So, um, and, but he's willing, like, you know, at least the character is willing to go into, like, the... The, you know, into uh, active combat, you know, to help, you know, be the hero, essentially. So that all comes through in his acting and the characters he plays. Um, let's see. Else. The thing is, because Rahu is here it, with its dispositor, so that's the owner of the house that it's in, that means that you can take five and nine aspects away from Rahu, so it's going to, you can think of Rahu also in... The second house, if you follow the blue arrows, turquoise arrows, out from Rahu. Um, so all this energy is going to be in the second house, which is like um, communication, face, uh, savings, assets, that sort of thing. Um, and also the eighth house. So um, so that's going to be this you know, unusual, unexpected, hidden energy of Rahu and ambition is going to be cast through more of the chart. Um, now if we look opposite to that you have Saturn retrograde in its own house super super strong double primary strength um, it's with K2 and look it's like just a few minutes away from K2 so because they're basically like locked together there that means Saturn and K2 are gonna you know even when you start diving into subzodiacs which is kind of you slice and dice up this natal chart um, this energy is going to translate through deep through this chart. Um, you know, again, Saturn, there's going to be a lot of strength here um, um, in like practical ways. Um, and the thing is, Saturn, you can see the one blue arrow. I only blew, drew one blue arrow. It, Saturn aspects into more of this stuff, but more houses. But, you know, Saturn, this really super strong Saturn is aspecting into the first house here of self and fame. And um, Saturn is exalted in Libra. So it's almost like triple, almost, you can kind of think of it as triple primary quadruple strength or something like that. This is going to be a super strong person. Even though there's instability from the, the Swati Nakshatra. Um, and there's, you know, there's instability here from the K2, you know, Saturn being locked up with K2 here. K2 is like, 
Mars, but like on acid or on crack or something like that. Like it's Mars, but like amplified and even more unpredictable and hidden and just like, you know, coming out like, you know, like with daggers, you know, <laughs> you know, like unexpectedly, like, um, uh, so, you know, it's, I mean, I was looking for fire and this is like kind of extreme fire really. Um, and then the Saturn, super strong Saturn is also Lord of the fifth house of creativity. So you can see how all this, you know, and then this whole axis of like home and work, home is the fourth house and work career is the 10th house. There's a lot of energy here. It's pretty much all here. Um, what else do I want to say here? Oh, the first house is also aspected by Jupiter. Jupiter is in Aquarius in the fifth house. It's retrograde. It's also strong. So Jupiter will give this some benevolence to the first house. Um, it's in Chateaubisha though. So um, that can indicate um, things, things that are difficult to heal or healers either way. Um, so there may be some things within this person that are difficult to heal. The other thing is that Jupiter in the fifth house, which can represent, which is the house of children, and Jupiter is the house that represents children, or the planet that represents children. Jupiter um, in the fifth house can actually indicate um, difficulties with children. And um, we know if you follow um, him at all and know anything about his personal life, he's, I think, estranged from most of his children. Um, so there's issues there and that's going to be hard to remedy um, potentially and again this is his birth chart so this is his energy and karma starting out and it shifts over time which we'll look at actually the other thing is um, besides Jupiter being in the fifth house and that indicating problems with children which is a uh, that uh, formation is called a gar Karko Bhavanasha um, he also has a second Karko Bhavanasha, so he has son in the ninth house, which represents father, and son is the planet that represents father. So again, too much energy here. And I didn't read all of his bio, but, you know, just kind of read a few lines, and apparently his father was very unpredictable and abusive and that sort of thing, so issues with father, that's there. The other thing is that sun is in Gemini or Ardra Nakshatra, and I just talked about Ardra Nakshatra with the eclipse. Ardra Nakshatra is, again, a storm and electricity, like, you know, lightning bolts and stuff like that. It's not settled energy. Um, so, and it can also represent sadness. So it looks like, you know, I'm, I'm sure that was true if you had a father like that. Um, oh, and then also, I don't think I mentioned that because Saturn, K2 is with Saturn, which is, it's dispositor. So the dispositor is the Lord of the house that K2 is in. Um, you can also take the K2 energy and project it five and nine houses away. So now we have Rahu in a house projecting to another two houses. You have K2 in another house project. So basically half of the chart is influenced by this Rahu K2 energy. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot. So, you know, and again, this is two weeks away from an eclipse. That's kind of where we're at now. We're about three weeks away from an eclipse. So you can, if you're sensitive to these things, you can feel the energy building up and more just instabilities happening, more kind of unusual, bizarre things are happening. <clears throat> you can even see it in the news. So what else is going on here? Um, oh, I looked at the eighth house. Um, so he's got Mars here, Critica. Critica is a nakshatra that's kind of dual in nature. Um, it can represent um, like a warrior. So again, we got more of that warrior fiery energy, but it can kind of flip a little bit because there is that sort of warrior energy and kind of um, celebrated war hero, which is kind of what he was in the Top Gun movies. Um, but also there's this aspect of Mars or Critica nakshatra where there's like this um, idea of like foster parent, which is what he was actually, like he adopted children. Um, but there, there's that dual nature. So again, because it's dual, it can flip, you know, depending on different situation, mood, whatever. So again, there's, 
I think, uh, again, indications of mental instability, especially when you have the moon, which represents the mind, on the Rahu T A two axis. This is somebody who's going to be ambitious, but also have um, uh, potentially mental illness going on, um, or at least an unusual mind, you know, unusual thoughts, that sort of thing. And then Mercury here, which represents the mind and decision making, is in the eighth house of deep psychology, and it's in Mrigashira Nakshatra. Mrigashira is all about like searching and seeking, um, and research and stuff like that. So um, he's going to be a seeker in, in of things. I think he's like really hands on with his movies, and he's like you know, I think overlords like seems like every detail I mean I don't know but just even like the little trivia you know uh, things that pop up when I'm watching movies on the internet I'm like oh he's it's like he had enough time to think about this like um apparently he did and he made his made time for it um so yeah so there's gonna be a lot of mental churning here a lot of seeking and again this is in the eighth house of deep psychology but also things like esoterica. So I think there's indications here of, um, with the instability, with family, um, and early on in life, um, and this kind of drive and ambition. Um, I could see why somebody like this might turn towards Scientology um, or kind of support and sort of an alternative family to what he knew growing up. So, intense guy, unusual guy, you know, known around the world. Um, yeah, but also a, a lot of, um, I think, deep sadness and tragedy on a personal level, frankly. So, so I also um, looked at the, I uh, drew up a chart for the Top Gun movie, the original one that premiered in 1986, because um, I was just interested to see and um, <laughs> there's a lot of similar energy, so you know I thought we'd take a look at it. So the Top Gun original movie premiered um, May 12, 1986. I'm guessing at eight o'clock. That's what I put in in New York. In New York, um, I just guessed that time, um, and it did happen on that day. Um, but it just happened. It popped up that this is also a Libra Lugna. So what that means is that we could potentially use this chart as a Samaya chart. Uh, Samaya chart um, is an update chart. So it's basically a chart that you can cast when you're analyzing um, somebody's chart to see how their energy, their karma has shifted since their birth. Um, so this could be used as a Samaya chart for Tom Cruise, essentially. And he was 24 years old at the time that the movie was made. But you can see that, you know, if you just look at it here, we've got K2 and Rahu across the 1, 7 axis. So when you have Rahu or K2 in the first house, that's going to influence all the other houses. <laughs> yeah. Because that first house, like, colors the world of the person, place, or thing that you're looking at. So, um, what's changed? Um, again, still Lug Lugna in Libra. Um, the thing that was now Libra, the ascendant is in Vishaka. Vishaka is a sign or a nakshatra lunar mansion that's represented by a victory gate, which sounds nice. Um, but the thing is, uh, Vishaka nakshatra is kind of victory at any cost. So this is potentially somebody or something that's going to um, win, but. Um, with some collateral, with probably a lot of collateral damage. Um, you know, Rahu K2 um, on the 1 7 axis, you know, again, that gets into film um, and actors, that sort of thing. And it's also going to be like there's something hidden about it. And that's the thing about this Top Gun movie is that even Val Kilmer, who, Kil uh, Kilmer, who um, you know, was one of the stars in the movie, he didn't want to get involved because he's just like, everybody thought it was going to be a flop. So the fact that this movie did so well and was almost sort of like a cult thing, um, and, you know, they made a sequel, like, whatever, 30, 35 years later. <laughs> like, it, that tells you something. Like, um, it was Dark Horse. Nobody thought this movie was going to, you know, do anything. Um, and it was, like, a big hit. It also was unusual because they had to, like, 
create all these new ways of filming. That was something that was really innovative about this film is that they had to create all these new ways of filming in the cockpits um, to get the footage that they got. So that was pretty interesting, actually. Um, so let's, you know, again, break this down. So we're still looking at the first house here, K2. You know, again, it's it's there. So K2 and this energy of, you know, this kind of Mars on steroids type thing. Um, and just even more unpredictable, more hidden, more um, virulent, frankly, um, you know, is going to color the whole chart. Um, and K2 is in Chitra. Chitra is um, the symbol of that. Nakshatra is a gemstone, which can indi indicate things like, you know, material wealth, but it can also, like, indicate things like structure, you know, like, st like the structure of the planes of a cut stone, gemstone. So, again, there's like a restructuring. This is an unusual structure to a movie that happened. And also, like, it made, you know, a lot of money. <laughs> um, what else? You also have Jupiter aspecting in here. You have Mercury aspecting into the first house. And you have Sun aspecting in the Merc into the first house. Even though Sun is debilitated in Libra, you know, you've got a lot of energy. You've got innovation. You've got um, um, uh, fire, and you've got media here. Mercury and Jupiter represent media. Um, and this was the top gun premiere, so this specifically was um, basically a promotional thing, right? Public media um, relations going on here. Um, let's see. One thing I was curious about was Venus here went to the eighth house. Um, the eighth house again represents things that are hidden, um, you know, death, destruction, bankruptcy, typically esoterica, that sort of thing. And that's actually what happened in the movie. There was death and destruction, you know, blowing up of planes, and you know, people died and all that. I mean, it's a very dangerous type of activity. But again, if we're going back to this idea of using this chart as a semi-optic chart for Tom Cruise instead of being in the limelight, like up front and center, he's down in the eighth house. And I was sort of curious, because, you know, again, I, I don't know his whole background with Scientology or whatever, but I was like, I wonder when he got involved with Scientology, <laughs> like when he really started getting involved. The thing is, this blew my mind. So this movie premiered in 1986. Apparently he was converted by his wife, Mimi Rogers, um, who was also an actress. Um, into Scientology in 1986. So while this movie was like blowing up or whatever, um, you know, Tom Cruise was like on a new path here. And it actually makes sense because if you also look at the seventh house, one, you could look at it two ways. One you could look at it as like a new business, which essentially is what Top Gun the movie was. It is a business in and of itself, you know. Um, you're also looking at this being the seventh house of partnerships and spouse. So you have Sun, Exalted, and Aries. This is going to be a super fiery, take charge, partner, unusual um, from the Rahu aspect, um, and um, very intelligent because, again, there's going to be this um, Buddha Ditcha Yoga thing going on here. Um, you know, if we if we if we analyze all this from that house, very ambitious, um, and the thing is, again, the eighth house is going to be the second house to the seventh house, which means that that's going to be the place of gains for the person represented by the seventh house or the spouse. So um, Venus, uh, in its own sign, that means that Mimi Rogers, who was the spouse at the time gained a lot, <laughs> gained a lot through being married to Tom Cruise. Um, but it also means that she was the leader here. Um, with K2 in the first house, that can be like destructive energy, frankly. Um, even though Tom Cruise was winning, you know, on the professional level, all that instability from the birth chart, that hasn't gone anywhere. It seems like that hasn't shifted significantly from the, you know, if we use this as a Samaya update chart. So she completely led him 
and he was you know again Rahu is now in his birth chart Rahu was in the 10th house of career so he was looking for you know in his mind was probably thinking more you know um, whatever nine to five job or whatever but now Rahu all that ambition is driving towards spouse partnership marriage it's also driving through independent business so this is when his career took off and he probably not only started thinking about you know well he's married now but the other thing is and um you know Rahu is almost so Rahu has been in the sign for almost a complete year and a half so that's when all this that stuff with Mimi Rogers probably kicked up um or, or you know gelled um but the other thing is that he's probably starting to think of himself now as he, Tom Cruise is thinking of himself as the business like Tom Cruise Incorporated and also this might be the beginnings of him be getting more into like um producing and stuff like that which is what he does now so um did I cover everything then okay so let's do, let me just look at my notes here so Rahu is shifted um, Saturn actually aspects three houses away so we're recreating that Saturn retrograde in its own house so there's still going to be issues like there's strength and family but there's still issues there um, and also that Saturn um, is going to influence it aspects as direct into the eighth house so Saturn represents religion it can also represent things like things that are hidden, skepticism, that sort of thing. So that's gonna, you know, again, tie in that Scientology stuff. Um, before we had Sun in Ardra in the ninth house. Now we have new Moon in Gemini Ardra in the ninth house. So there's still this like um, sadness, um, chaotic energy in the ninth house of father. Um, I believe his father passed away. I don't remember when, but passed away from cancer. I think about this time or not too far away from this time. There's still some sadness there. He's still got Jupiter, um, in the fifth house. So still indications that there can be problems with children. Um, and he did, you know, again, he did have problems conceiving. I think that's why he and his second wife, Nicole Kidman adopted children. Um, maybe he was trying to have children with Mimi Rogers. It didn't work out. And again, Jupiter is going to be in Purva Bhadra Nakshatra, Purva Bhadrapada Nakshatra, which is symbolized um, by the legs of a funeral cot. So that might have indicated things like uh, miscarriage, potentially. Um, but he does have a second cargo Bhavanesha. This time, the cargo Bhavanesha is in uh, the third house of siblings. Because he's got Mars, the planet that represents siblings, in the third house that represents siblings. So now there's also like, it's almost like three cargo babanashas that this guy has. So just more family issues, really. That's probably why he was so, you know, needing and wanting to um, put all this energy into, you know, creating a marriage or spouse so he would have some, some family for himself, I guess. That's what I'm guessing here. Um... The other thing about all this is that Sun, Mercury, Rahu in Aries, um, in Ashwini, and that sort of thing, it's basically very similar to the current sky pattern. So there's some similarities here. And again, this also, this Top Gun movie premiere happened just about two weeks um, after a total lunar eclipse, which was April 24th, 1986. So there's still all this, like, you know, K2 Rahu, Rahu energy, eclipse energy happening here. Um, so yeah, um, unusual, unexpected, stands out, but with issues, yeah. So here's another chart, um, not to, you know, you know beat, the, beat the horse over the head or whatever, go over this too much, but just another example. And this is kind of in the moment. So, um, you know, again, the eclipse is coming, you know, in about two and a half weeks now, three weeks. Um, but we're already, if you're paying attention even to the news, like you can start to feel the energy shifting. Um, this chart is for when President, ex-President Trump was indicted. And this is a standout moment in history <laughs> because this is the first time an ex-US president has been charged with a crime. And Donald Trump, if you 
do end up, or if you have watched my uh, video, teaching video on solar lunar eclipses, he was born during um, a solar eclipse. So Trump himself is sort of an embodiment of eclipse energy. I mean, regardless of whether you agree with him, like him or not, or agree with his politics or not, he's a very unpredictable guy. <laughs> And he's got planets in Ardra Nakshatra as well. So he's got all this sort of stormy energy and eclipse energy. Like, you never know what this guy's going to do or say. You know, there's always some hidden motive or action. Or whatever. So um, in any case, um, I drew this chart up at the time. It was funny. I, I, I saw the headline earlier in the day when it was kind of came out on the news. But I didn't, like, dive into looking at the moment. This is the moment when I actually started looking at it. This is like 9.15 Eastern Standard Time on March 30th, so just a few days ago. Um, and look at what we have here. We have, again, a Libra Lugna <laughs> with K2 here. Oh, wow. Like, I mean, it just, like, blows my mind how this works out sometimes. Like, I mean, three times. Like, without me even trying. I mean, Tom Cruise's chart... Top Gun premier chart, now Trump getting indicted chart. Like, there's some message here, folks. So we have K2 here. So again, more instability. And the Lugna and K2 are both in Swati. So there's this instability here. Um, and again, this is Libra. So Libra energy, it's about um, business. Um, we have the moon here again. Uh, the moon is in Pusha. Um, so uh, the moon in its own sign and constellation in the 10th house, you know, this is about um, the public in some way. Um, and then where has Venus, the uh, planet that rules Libra gone, it's gone to the 7th house of independent business um, and relationships. <laughs> So this is actually looking like a cross between Tom Cruise's energy and the Top Gun premier energy. So you can actually take this even as like a, because I was looking kind of at all these charts the same, but you could take this as like the newest Samaya chart for Tom Cruise if you wanted to. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, this chart just like also blows me away. So now you have Saturn in its own sign in the fifth house. So Saturn's in its own sign again, again, restructuring here, you know, strength here, but more in a air sign. So more about ideas, more than material, like hands on. This is more about um, creating, counseling, advising on um, like creative directions. Uh, Saturn is in Shatabisha, so there's some difficulty here, um, things that are hard to heal. And this is in the sign of the fifth house of children. So, um, but uh, it can also be advice. So, uh, sorry, I'm starting to mix up. Like for me, it's all kind of one now because I've seen these charts. I've been looking at these charts. Let's get back to, let's refocus on Trump. So this also happens because again, Rahu and K2, I find that whenever I do videos, and things around Rahu K2 time, eclipse time, like again, the energy of them, it's getting stronger and they're all about illusion, defu uh, delusion, confusion. So I t I, I'm not t typically a very confused person, but I tend to get more confused. Uh, so um, excuse that, that's Rahu K2 playing out, I believe. But um, so if we just look at this from Trump, it looks like there is somebody here <laughs> who gave advice to do this. Um, why also? Because if we also look at the eighth house of enemies, um, we have Jupiter in its own house. And Jupiter is in Revati, which is a nice, gentle nakshatra. So, but it's in this um, house of enemies. So that's interesting. You also have uh, Mercury, um, which is like friends and acquaintances and stuff like that. You have that in Revati. The thing is you have Jupiter and Mercury both combust right now because they're close to the sun. So you can't actually see Jupiter and, and Mercury. You have all this thinking going on. 
um, you have this nice energy of the moon in its own sign in the 10th house. You have Jupiter in its own sign with Mercury. You know, there's something about media and communications here. Um, let me just see. Okay. Um, so because you can't see Jupiter and Mercury, you can't see the communication, you can't see the thinking. You have Rahu and Ketu, like, you know, on top of all of this. So it's hiding things. Um, and then if we look at Mars here, finally, you have Mars in the ninth house, which can also represent things like authority and, and government. Mars is a disruptive planet, and it's in, again, this nakshatra of Ardra, like a storm. Um, what I'm getting from this is this is basically like a, you know, political theater. <laughs> like this was a crafted incident to stir the pot to basically gain support. Um, and very much so, this is about like basically reverse psychology. Because Venus here is not only the lord of the first house of like um, fame and person and reputation and stuff like that, but it's also the lord of the eighth house of what we've been talking about, like deep psychology. And because Venus is here um, with Rahu, um, you know, this is going to be like unusual, unpredictable psychology. <laughs> um, and you also have Venus aspecting onto. K2, so K2 is also, um, you know, you can take the fifth and, and ninth aspects away from K2, so you have this K2, K2 energy of um, being like a massive disruptor, you know, and even more so than on Mars, it's aspecting onto Saturn, um, and it's also aspecting onto Mars. So this is like just this sort of ingenious, really, um, method of basically regaining, um, stirring the pot and regaining um, uh, support for Trump. Like, you know, like you would think, oh, you know, the ex-president just got, you know, charged with a crime. Like, oh, he's done. No, this, like, it's, and actually that's what happened, like, within hours, I guess they just did a new poll, poll or something, and he has charged ahead of all his political rivals who are going to compete with him for um, the Republican nomination for presidency. So this is, like, I mean, like, wild and crazy, but effective, <laughs> essentially. So, and because, like, again, it's, like, Jupiter and Mercury hidden, like, the the even though this is a media campaign, it's not a direct, it's an indirect media campaign. So it's almost like, it, it made me think of like, you know, you see on, on, the, on the internet, you know, mass media now, like, you know, Instagram, Facebook or whatever, you see these things where it's like, tell me you're a dog owner without telling me you're a dog owner. So you post a picture of you with your dog. Like you don't actually say it, but you show it. <laughs> and it's kind of like that. like. They're not saying like, hey, Trump's, you know, like this, you know, lightning rod of attention <laughs> and stuff. But essentially that's what they've crafted here. So it's just like, wow, like just, you know, it's sort of mind boggling um, in how somebody like, it spins my brain around thinking around how some, thinking about how some, trying to get into somebody's head and thinking like they did to craft this whole thing and to make it work for them like you know um you know this public relations team is just like wild and crazy man but apparently very effective so phew, gotta give them some credit I guess. um even if you don't agree with the outcome or the the means like there's still something that's sort of like impressive here um and then i think the only other thing is um i have arrows here so jupiter is aspecting on to the second house of again face and voice and speaking and it's also um, aspecting on to the tenth house here and Jupiter is exalted in the tenth house uh, I mean not the tenth house but in, in cancer so all this 
you know, communication, even though it's undercover, is just blowing up the 10th house of career and fame. So, you know, well played, I guess. <laughs> um, so that's that. But again, another bizarre um, and unusual history-making event that is what comes from eclipses. Um, you know, eclipses, it's just unusual, unpredictable, things you never could have imagined, but things like rec world records are broken at, during this sort of time. That's the energy of eclipses. So just another example, so you kind of get it, right? So what else is going on? There's other stuff going on besides the, all this eclipse on <laughs> this month. So let's talk about Venus and uh, Mercury and Venus. So April 6th, Mercury crosses Rahu and Aries. So again, this uh, Mesha, Aries, Ashwini energy. Mercury, as I mentioned, symbolizes things like travel, communication, business, aunts, uncles, friends, acquaintances. So there can be unexpected issues happening uh, the day that Mercury crosses Rahu. Um, Mercury's going retrograde April 21st, um, so right about the time of these eclipse. So probably this, when it, Mer when a planet goes retrograde, it gains power. Mercury's all about rationality, thinking, deciding. Um, so when it goes retrograde, going backwards, we're, we're going to be doing a lot of rethinking, reconsidering, reflecting. So whatever, whatever this eclipse sparks, um, there's going to be a lot of reassessment that's going on and uh, new decision, you know, rethinking decisions and stuff like that. Um, or rethinking even things like travel, communication, business, that sort of thing. Um, then on the 23rd, right after the eclipse, a couple days later, Mercury goes combust or asta. And again, I made a video, a teaching video on planetary combustion if you want to check that out. But um, the things, the outward things that Mercury represents, you know, in a nutshell, the outward things that Mercury represents can be um, loss um, temporarily or permanently. So there can be loss or delay of travel, communication, business, aunts, uncles, like friends, and acquaintances. Um, but this, the inner qualities of Mercury that Mercury represents are going to be more intense, highlighted, active. So things like thinking, deciding, planning, that sort of thing. So there's going to be a lot of thinking going on here. Um, then Venus, what's Venus doing this month? So on the 6th, I mentioned Venus is entering Taurus or Vrishaba. It's on sign, so it's going to gain strength. It's going to become more grounded because Taurus is a um, earth sign. It's also a fixed sign. So things of the heart, thing, thing planets, uh, not planets, uh, the arts might get a little bit grounded, get some traction here if something is going on there. And then on April 14th, Venus is entering Rohini Nakshatra. And again, Rohini Nakshatra is like beautiful, attractive, the arts, grace. Like if you know Lakshmi, goddess energy at all, it's sort of like Lakshmi energy, beauty, grace, the goddess of love and abundance and that sort of thing. So at that time, uh, Venus might take on this characteristic. It might indicate things like strong attraction or harmony with loved ones or love interest or the arts. So, um, and luckily Venus is not in the midst of all this eclipse energy going on. So there might be sort of a saving grace to all this going on. Um, what Sun and Mars doing? These are your fire planets. There's going to be energy and push and initiative with these planets. Um, on the 14th of April, Sun enters Aries. That's when you're going to get more, again, energy, intensity, action going on. It's going to start to, I kind of see it as like maybe sparking um, in a more intense way. Um, Aries and Ashwini. Um, again, Sun is exalted here, so it's going to be very strong. It's a fire planet and a fire sign, and it's a Chara Rashi, so an active Rashi. So we're going to get things moving here. Um, April 20th, the solar eclipse. Again, it's going to involve both these planets. I've talked about that already. On April 24th, the sun is crossing Rahu. I went into that, so unexpected events with... Um, oh, no, I talked about the Saturn aspect incorrectly. Exactly, Saturn, or sun. So this is sun crossing Rahu. Rahu. So now you're going to have sun which indicates things like father, boss, authority, government, health, energy, direction, central nervous system, heart, bones. Um, I have a whole video on the symbolism of the sun if you want to get into all of it, but 
these are some of the things that sun symbolizes. It's going to cross Rahu. So there's going to be some unexpected event with some of these things going on here. And then um, the 21st of April, Mars enters Punarvasu Nakshatra, so right after this eclipse. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Mars is going to leave the Nakshatra of Ardra, so the stormy energy, and it's going to move into Punarvasu. Punarvasi, which is a nicer energy. It's kind of about coming back home. It's about, you know, again, the symbol of this nakshatra is a quiver of arrows. So it's kind of like um, <clears throat> going out but coming home again, travel and, and redoing. And um, with Mars being the planet that represents action, it's like this, you know, again, it can be something like suturi, bringing things back together again. Um, you know, like maybe traveling back and forth, commuting, or even helping, because again, it's still in this Parivartana exchange of houses with um, Mercury, which is in Aries. So, um, ho you know, again, I'm seeing it as like a, at least a, um, less chaotic energy than Ardra Nakshatra, which it's been in for a few weeks. And then we have Jupiter here. So Jupiter is also doing it's shifting a bit. On April 11th, there's going to be exact combustion of Jupiter. That's when Jupiter is at the exact point of where Sun is. So it's at its highest point of combustion. And again, I have a video on planetary combustion. But the outer aspects of Jupiter, which are things like teacher, children, education, spiritual advisor, law, justice, grace, they're going to be lacking. You're not going to see them on the surface in the material world. Um, as much. So this might be something like you don't feel like you get justice in a court action or you might feel like um, this might be kids uh, going on vacation, spring break, that sort of thing. Or your teacher might be out, you know, as an absence or something like that. Um, but the inner qualities that Jupiter represents, things like wisdom, intuition, spirituality can be heightened. Yeah. On April 17th, Jupiter goes Sunday, so that's the last, it enters the last degree of Pisces. That's going to make it unstable. So even though Jupiter um, is considered the great benefic, you know, it's going to be a little bit wobbly at that time. And it's not initially going to be involved in, um, you know, this eclipse energy. So unfortunately, it's not going to... Um, provide much grace to the eclipse as it happens, but luckily it's actually sliding into this um, eclipse area, you know, within a day or so. So then on April 24th, again, Jupiter enters Aries, Ashwini, and all this eclipse energy, and it's going to be there for a year. And again, Aries in general, besides the eclipse that's currently going on, you know, once these planets start shifting out, because um, Sun's leaving in a few weeks, and Mercury's going to leave soon, um, Jupiter is going to, one, be in Ashwini, so newness, action, healing, uh, travel, there can be a lot of energy there over the next year, and again, there's going to be a lot of movement, um, and Aries, again, it's the first constellation of the zodiac, so it's all about beginnings, so we're going to have probably a lot there, so benevolence, growth, healing, travel, these sorts of things. And again, post-eclipse, I kind of, you know, I, I would guess that with, you know, Jupiter kind of showing up into the middle of this eclipse energy, um, this is like an international emergency response to something that's going on or related to this eclipse is what I see. Um, and then luckily also, because still Jupiter's in combustion here and Jupiter's in Sunday, so the outward benevolence that Jupiter can bring won't be seen and it's unstable but luckily that stability comes back you know once it, it gets traction and, and it gains its sea legs basically um, it leaves the first degree of the first um, first degree of Aries it'll get more stable and it leaves combustion so it's almost like you know in the movies when the superhero like you know gets into it with the villain and gets beat up and then they go off, you know, kind of lick their wounds and they're kind of like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. You know, they're kind of regaining their strength um, and their, their faith in themselves or their duty or whatever. 
and then they kind of shoot back out of like the cave or something. You know, they shoot back into the middle of the action, um, almost like Tom Cruise did actually, like um, in the Top Gun movie, right? I mean, his best buddy and um, wingman um, unfortunately died through an accident, um, and the movie was all about Tom Cruise's character having to regain his confidence and flying in and, and basically saving the day. Um, you know, unexpectedly. So, there you go. Um, so, yeah. There you go. So, hopefully, again, at the end of the month, even though things are, you know, unstable, um, you know, the other thing to think about is that Jupiter is going to be here because in two weeks after this eclipse, um, in two weeks after that, so in, in the May 5th or 6th or something, we're going to have the lunar, the corresponding lunar eclipse. Um, so at least for the lunar eclipse, Jupiter is going to be involved. Um, so that should make the lunar eclipse less um, problematic. Um, so that's good news. So, you know, try to end on a good note. It's not all doom and gloom this month, but there will be some intensity and unexpected events. So that you can count on. Expect the unexpected. Okay, so whoa, I always suggest, you know, if you don't have a copy of your chart, you can get one easily, for, you know, for free on the internet. Um, if you find out where Aries and Libra are for you, because that's where the eclipses are going to happen, especially this month, it's all about Aries, but all these planets, even though I keep talking about Aries, 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 and Ashwini, these planets are also aspecting light into Libra, the opposite house of Aries. So find out, look, get a copy of your chart, find out where the Aries-Libra axis is, figure out which house you know, it is here, if it's the first house, first, seventh house axis, second, eighth house axis, or whatever. And then you can look at which of these houses or bhavas, um, bhava is just the Sanskrit for house, um, that will give you an indication of which aspects of your life these eclipses will um, have probably the greatest influence. All right, so here we go. Here we have the one seven axis what are indicated by those houses, the 2-8 axis, the 3-9 house axis. Um, and then the next slide here, we have the 4-10 axis, which is home and career, 5-11, which is like children and groups, 6-12 axis, which is enemies and law. So, um, you know, that can give you some clue as to, you know, and again, unless you go deep into things and know which planets are active for you, what planetary periods you're going into, unless you get into subzodiac or Amsha analysis, which are, you know, deeper levels of analysis um, on an individual basis, you know, don't freak out from <laughs> anything I say or any report, you know, astrological report somebody um, puts out there. You got to take it all in context individual context to really make sense of it, to really know what's going on. So there you go, uh, April. Um, there's going to be a lot of moving and shaking um, and maybe some quaking as well, um, for better or worse. So um, thanks again for your time as always. Um, you know, again, if you're interested in learning more about Vedic Astrology, check out some of my Vedic Astrology teaching videos. You can find those in the in my playlist, concepts playlist. Um, I'm putting my videos in playlists so that they're easy to find. Um, I also have another YouTube channel on natural medicine that talks about other Vedic arts such as Ayurveda and yoga, but also homeopathy and naturopathic medicine. Uh, the name of that YouTube video is Nature Source Care. Um, so as always, I hope, um, you know, doing readings like this and interpretation like this is helpful and interesting to you as you navigate your life. And, you know, it looks like there's going to be definitely some bumps in the road, minor for some people, pretty major for others. Um, but I hope that this gives you some light clarity um, to work through those um, both good and challenging times. All right. So until the next one, take care. Namaste.